Hello, I'm Leslie from Cambridge ESOL and it's lovely to see so many of you with us this morning. I'd like to start by giving you some general information about Cambridge Assessment. Cambridge Assessment was established 150 years ago. We're an international exams group and a not-for-profit organisation. We're a department of Cambridge University comprised of three exam boards and with the largest research capability of its kind. We advise governments and NGOs and we also partner industry leaders to deliver the best products and services. Recently we've produced a Principles of Good Practice document to help describe some of the key concepts involved in quality language testing. This document's free to download from our website. At Cambridge ESOL, writing's an integral part of almost all of our language testing exams. This means we're involved in a continuous cycle of research into the different elements of writing and how they interact with each other. We need to know what the different aspects of writing ability are, what's actually involved in producing a text. We need to know how to measure these aspects at different levels of ability, from elementary up to advanced. And we also need to know what this means for learners as they work on improving their writing ability. How can positive learner behaviour be encouraged? I'll now pass you over to my colleague, Gad Lim. Well, thank you, Leslie, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today, we'd like to provide you with a background to the updated writing mark scheme, show you what the assessment scales look like and how they work, and share with you some ideas for engaging with a mark scheme in your work as teachers. There are a number of reasons and requirements that uh, motivated the updated mark scheme. First of all, at Cambridge ESOL, we have a cyclical process of test development and revision so periodically we review our different exams and their components. In this case, the review allowed us to revisit the construct behind our writing tests and look into ways in which it could be made more explicit. Secondly, there is a framework that is widely used across Europe called the Common European Framework of Reference, or CFR. Our exams are closely aligned to this framework. In fact, when the framework was developed, a number of the levels were based on Cambridge English exams. So there's actually already a natural relationship between our exams and the framework. Nevertheless, we wanted to make this relationship more explicit. In updating the scales, we also needed to account for the fact that we have a number of products at the same CFR level. Thus, we had an opportunity to look into how harmonized our marking was across different exams at the same level and to ensure that marking practices were consistent. In addition to this horizontal relationship, our exams also have a vertical relationship. That is, uh, candidates taking a test can often show evidence of ability at a higher level, and candidates who are not quite at a level can nevertheless show evidence of at least being at the level below. We thus wanted to build an assessment scale that can formally capture these relationships. Well, having given you an overview of some of the reasons, I'd like to now go into a little more detail about each one of these, starting with a construct or the ability that a test is trying to measure. So previously, our assessment scales were not very easy to share with uh, you, the general public. This is because the scale points were described more generally, for example, with words like reasonable achievement or full achievement of the task, with a note that said that the mark scheme needed to be interpreted at the level of the task. Now, our examiners are very experienced and understand these levels very well. However, some candidates and teachers uh, might not be familiar with our tests, and they would find it more difficult to determine how much achievement uh, students and learners already had or which areas they needed to do more work in. So we endeavored to develop a more concrete assessment scale. We started this process by reviewing the construct behind our exams, and it became apparent that uh, different theories and models of writing ability all had a few elements in common. First, in writing, people produce a text, uh, so a message is always a part of the equation. 
But in order to produce this message, uh, it would require a person to use uh, their mental capacities. Uh, so they needed to think about ideas. So there's always a cognitive dimension involved. These ideas in people's heads, however, need to be translated and expressed in a particular language. So for example, if in your head you had an image of something with a brown trunk and green leaves, you needed to translate this image into the word T-R-E-E -E for tree in English. So there is a linguistic dimension to writing ability. And messages are always written for communicating in a particular context to particular people which requires particular ways of expressing things. So there is a sociolinguistic dimension to writing ability. And finally, it is important to note that these different dimensions interact with one another, which we represent here now using the arrows. So you know that you need to use uh, these different skills in tandem in order to be able to produce a message. Now, the construct is actually accounted for in Cambridge English writing tasks. Here now, showing up on your screens, for example, is a stripped-down skeleton of a Cambridge first task. It might say something along the lines of, write a letter to your friend about X and Y asking about Z. Now, I'd like us to engage in an activity for which you will be using uh, your polling buttons, which can be found at the bottom uh, in the middle of the screen, right underneath uh, where your names appear. Okay. What I'd like us to do now is to look at the different parts of the task, and for each one, I want you to decide which aspect of writing ability is captured by that part of the task rubric. So again, we will be using the polling function. When each part of the task comes up, please select A if you think that part is about eliciting a message, B, if you think that part is intended to capture the cognitive dimension. C, if it's the linguistic dimension. And finally, D, if you think it's meant to elicit the sociolinguistic dimension. Okay, are you ready? All right. So the first part of uh, the task is clearly the part where we just tell people to write something. Okay, so when we ask candidates to write something, what do you think uh, is a sort of evidence that this gives us as an exam board? about their abilities. Okay, so use the polling uh, buttons again, and if you think it's uh, in order for us to be able to elicit a message, then click A. If you think it's about the cognitive dimension, click B. Uh, C if you think it's the linguistic dimension, and then click D if it's uh, the sociolinguistic, uh, if it's the sociolinguistic dimension. Okay? So I'm going to turn now to the screen and take a look at what your responses are. Okay, some of you are putting your responses in the chat box. Don't put it in the chat box. Above the chat box is the polling function. You can see a big A, B, C, D there. Please click on those. And if I could repeat the question, the question is, which aspect of the construct is the word right capturing? Okay. Well, sorry, it's a bit late for that because I see that um, the response has already come up on your screens. And most of you think, 24% of you think the correct answer is C, that it uh, helps us tap the linguistic dimension. And then a close 23% uh, of you thought uh, it's about getting a message. Okay, in, in, in many ways, both of you are correct, though really the first thing that this helps us to capture, in fact, is the linguistic dimension. Because when people write things, then we have a text and then we actually have an, uh, some evidence about people's linguistic abilities. Okay, now let's expand that a little bit. When we tell candidates to write about a particular topic X, so now you see on your screen, write about X. Okay, this as topic X, which aspect of writing ability do you think are we aiming at? So again, the question is, when we, tell, when, when we give candidates a particular topic to write about, is this intended to give us evidence about A, the message, B, the cognitive dimension, C, the linguistic dimension, or D, the social linguistic dimension? Okay, again, please use the polling function, A, B, C, D, click on the correct letter, 
for what you think uh, this particular part of the task rubric is trying to achieve. Uh, some of you are asking if you could choose a few. Just go for the primary one. Okay, uh, interesting. Uh, the results are now up on your screen, and it looks like the majority of you think uh, that writing about X gives us evidence about the cognitive dimension, and then some of you, 18% uh, of you, think it's about the message. Again, uh, wonderfully, both of you are actually correct in that um, in giving people a topic to write about, then actually uh, the message dimension is captured because then we can tell whether they are writing about what they've been asked to write about. On the other hand, of course, it does require the cognitive dimension in order to be able uh, to write about that topic. So both of you are correct, but primarily when we specify a topic, uh, we were thinking of uh, hopefully being able to give us something about the message. Okay, let's look at the next part of this uh, task rubric. And it says, write a letter to your friend about X. Okay, so now, not only do we specify that they need to write or write about X, in addition, we say you need to write a letter to your friend. Okay, now why do you think we include this bit in the task? Is it to give us evidence about A, the message, B, the cognitive dimension, C, the linguistic, or D, the social linguistic? Okay, this is another poll for you. So, A, B, C, D please click on what you think is the correct answer for this one. Okay. I think the task is actually on the screen, well, and you are very quick on this one. Uh, we see the results already. 62% of you, a very large majority, think that the correct answer is the social linguistic dimension, and you are, of course, correct again. Okay, very well done because when we specify the genre and the audience, that's a way for us to make sure that the writing sample uh, can be evaluated for social linguistic, uh, for the social linguistic dimension of writing ability. Okay, so finally, let's look at one last part of this rubric. Okay, it says, write a letter to your friend about X and Y asking Z. So in many of our tasks, quite often, we don't just ask candidates to do one thing, we ask them to do multiple different things. Okay, and I think you already know what the correct answer for this one should be, so we won't conduct a poll. When we ask them to do multiple things, then candidates, uh, there is a bit of complexity there, and so candidates will need to think through what they want to say. They need to organize their ideas um, so that overall uh, their writing is coherent and makes sense. So, of course, this is meant to target the cognitive dimension of writing ability. Um, because then it gives us a sense of what's going on in their heads. Okay, So I think from this brief activity, you can see that the writing tasks cover the different aspects of writing ability. It would therefore be good if the assessment criteria also picked up on these. And so it should be no surprise that when we develop the assessment scale we eventually adopted, uh, it actually has four subscales, as you see now on your screens. Now, please don't worry if you can't read the words on the screen, because Leslie uh, will go into more detail about these with you later on, and you'll be able to read some of them. In addition, uh, all, this, all the scales are actually available in the teacher handbooks, uh, so you can pick those up, uh, download them online, and be able to look into them. But briefly, you will see that we have four subscales, content, communicative achievement, organization, and language. And I think uh, you can match things up as well in this case. The content subscale tells us how well candidates achieve the task, the particular thing we ask them to do, so that covers the message bit. Communicative achievement focuses on how well the conventions of a particular genre are used, therefore accounting for the social linguistic dimension of writing ability. The cognitive dimension is more challenging as we cannot peer into candidates' heads 
but from the way they organize their writing, we are able to get some indirect insight into their thought processes. So organi organization is an indirect way of accounting for the cognitive aspect of writing ability. And finally, of course, language captures the linguistic aspect of writing ability. So you can see that examiners now mark responses in such a way that all the primary aspects of writing ability are accounted for. I think this is very important because the first time we ran this webinar with you the other day, many of you um, ask a lot of questions about the linguistic aspect of things. But remember, there are other aspects to writing ability. So in teaching your students, you want to make sure you also uh, work with them about these different dimensions, working on organization, working on uh, register, working on genre, because these will serve your students well, and it's important in the real world. Well, moving on now. We all, remember, we also wanted to create a more explicit link between our assessment scale and mark scheme uh, and the CFR. Among other things, the CFR recommends that assessment scale descriptors should have the qualities you see on the screen now. For example, they need to be phrased positively as far as possible so that learners know what they're able to do rather than what they are not able to do. And as you will see later, we have done just that. The positive descriptors uh, making it possible for us to share the assessment scale uh, with students and with learners. Okay, because we, if they were negative, then you know, we, we would not feel comfortable sharing them with learners because that might discourage them uh, from the, in their learning. Okay, the descriptors also need to be definite. So in terms of language, for example, the descriptors would now state what kinds of structures candidates uh, are able to produce, whether simple, complex, and how well they handle each one of these. And in order to make sure that our descriptors are at the right CFR levels, when they were being developed, we sent them out to a panel of experts, and we asked them to tell us if each one of these was at the intended level. If, in their opinion, the descriptors were not, then we revised them. And we repeated this process until the experts agreed that each one represented the targeted CFR level. So this helps assure us that when we mark using these new mark schemes, uh, that the correct CFR levels are actually reflected. Well, let me move on now to another reason why we updated the writing mark scheme, that is to create alignment horizontally among our exams at the same level, as you see in the illustration. This would hopefully give you some insight as well into why the scale descriptors are worded uh, the way they are. Okay? Because remember, we have different exams at the same level, um, but they have different specific features, and the mark scheme has to work across all of these exams. So here, for example, is an early draft of uh, the content uh, subscale. Okay? Now, what I'd like you to do, uh, you have a task to do here, so pay attention. Uh, what I'd like you to do now is to read the descriptors and think about, is there anything in the descriptors that you might want to change and why. Okay? So what I'd like you to do is read through them and then share your observations on what you might change in the chat box. Okay? Let's take a minute or so for uh, this particular task. Uh, you, uh, some people are saying you can't see the descriptors, okay? So there's a whiteboard there uh, where you can see uh, the PowerPoint, if you would, okay? Um, and yes, one of you missed the question. The question is, is there anything in uh, the descriptors that you would change or why you think it would not work? Okay, some of you think that if you wrote a piece, you wouldn't know what to improve. Uh, take out the negatives, more detail. It's a bit general. Misses a context. Appropriate and fully are vague. We need to define minor omissions. Mostly address. There's a bit of negativity.
Okay, a lot of you are thinking that it invites subjectivity. What about spelling problems? Okay, uh, we will address that later. Well, let me go on then and point out, uh, thank you so much for your contributions. Let me point out some of the things that we notice. Okay, first of all, uh, note that it uses the word content points, but some of our tasks have content points, but some of them don't. So if we had a descriptor that talked about content points, it would actually be quite confusing for our examiners. Another thing we picked up is the mention of full development. And again, some of our tasks and some of the content points don't require much development. And again, that kind of phrasing can be uh, quite confusing. And finally, I think as some of you uh, have noted, the draft descriptor here actually tries to combine the message bit with a social linguistic bit. So you see a mention of register and format length as well as content points. And it just means there's too many things for examiners to attend to and to have to balance and therefore it does invite subjectivity. Okay, so here then is a look at the final version of the content scale. And you would see that it becomes a lot more simple because we separated the message bit and the social linguistic bit. You'll notice, uh, for example, that now content points simply says content. So now this descriptor works across different tasks and across different exams. You'll also see that relevance is addressed. So if someone uh, does something uh, that is not required in the task and is off topic, uh, then it is actually captured by the scale. And finally, earlier, remember, we had a problem with full development um, where some of the content points might not require development. Now we uh, phrase a descriptor in more succinct communicative terms by saying uh, whether the target reader is fully informed or not. Because if you develop all the points that need to be developed, then the target reader would be informed. And if you don't, then the target reader would not be fully informed. Okay, so you see the scale had to be usable across a number of exams which differ in their specific requirements. This imposed certain requirements and helped determine the final form of the descriptors. Now the descriptors might therefore seem slightly more general to you, um, but in fact our examiners are trained to know exactly how, what they mean and how to use them, and so you can be sure that the subjectivity is actually taken out. The other thing that I'd like to point out as an aside is that um, we are bound by this, these descriptors because we have multiple different exams that, should be, that would be using these descriptors. But in your case, when you are preparing candidates for a particular exam, you don't have to deal with the same restrictions. So I'd like to advise you that when you're working with your uh, students to please unpack the descriptors and find out how you can guide your students learning in a more detailed fashion. Okay? Well, let us move on now and think about the vertical alignment that is creating a relationship across exam levels up and down. Now to do this for each subscale, what we did was we created one descriptor for each CFR level. As you can see on your screen right now, for example, we created one descriptor for each subscale for, let's say, the B2 level. And then this descriptor is used as the 5 descriptor for preliminary. I think you can see a, a blinking button there now. And this is also the same descriptor that's used as the 3 descriptor for first and vantage at the B2 level. And then this same descriptor becomes the 1 descriptor for advanced or higher at the C1 level. Okay. Now don't worry for now about why we're not seeing the numbers 2 and 4. Leslie will explain that for us later. Okay, So here is a view of all the descriptors for communicative achievement, organization, and language. And again, don't worry if you can't read it. Okay, All I want to show you is how the different scale levels are related to each other. So the B1 scale simply uses the descriptors at the bottom of the overall scale. The B2 uses the descriptors higher up, and you can see that they overlap on two different sets of descriptors. The C1 scale moves further up, and finally the C2 scale uses the top end of the scale. 
Okay, I hope this was helpful for you to see uh, that the scale uh, has an overall framework, um, but that each one of them uses one part of the uh, overall framework. And by using this stacking approach, uh, we are able to establish a relationship between the scales at different levels. And therefore, if a candidate scores a, a 5 on one subscale in one exam, we now know they'll likely get a 3 in the exam at the next higher level. Okay? So this, among other things, makes it possible for us to determine how candidates would do if they took an exam at an adjacent level and to give them credit for those abilities when appropriate. Now you might ask why the above, why what I've just shown you includes does not include the content scale. Okay? Uh, in fact, the, the same content scale is used across all levels. Can you think of why that is? Well, put it into the chat box, though I think uh, the whiteboard already gives you a clue on why we actually use the same content scale across levels. Okay, so I have a question here which you might want to respond to in the chat box. Why is it that for the other three scales we have a stack scale, but for the content subscale we use the same scale across all levels? Some of you are saying content is an absolute, content is content. The task given is graded. Um, this is because the task isn't graded. The content is subjective. Uh, it's dependent on the task. Okay, I think we, we get the idea. Okay, the idea, of course, is that the tasks themselves are already... Uh, graded and appropriate for the level of the exam. So for example, the B1 task is easier than the C2 task. So if you're able to fulfill the B1 task, then you get full marks for content, and therefore that is appropriate at the B1 level. On the other hand, if you can fulfill the C2 task, which is a lot more challenging, then you should also get full marks using the same descriptor. Okay, so you can see that at least for content, we did not need to stack the descriptors because uh, the, the tasks themselves are already graded to the correct level of difficulty. Okay? Well, thank you. And at this point, I'd like to hand you back to my colleague, Leslie, who will now look into more detail about how the assessment scale works um, and how uh, you might be able to use it uh, with your students. Thanks, Gad. Um, as Gad said, I'd like to look now at how the new assessment scales work in practice for your learners. We look at the subscales and what the descriptors mean. Then we'll see how the subscales reward learners' ambition in their writing, as well as how poor performance is dealt with. I'll also go into how bands two and band four work. Then finally, we'll take a quick look at some ideas for using the assessment scales with your learners' work. We believe it's important that learners' ambition is recognised. By ambition, we mean a learner's attempt to use more complex language to express ideas. This is positive learner behaviour that we want to encourage, and so the assessment scales are designed to reward candidates who try to use more complex language. To see how this works, let's start by comparing some of the descriptors to see how they reflect different levels of performance. On the screen, you can see the descriptors for communicative achievement at B1 level, that's preliminary or PET level. Here's a task for you. Can you start by reading the descriptors for band 1 and band 3? There are at least two differences between the bands. Please type in the chat box any differences you can identify. So please read band 1 and band 3. Can you find any differences and type them into the chat box? So I see people picking up on words like conventions of the task, 
other people are picking up on appropriate ways to express ideas. Someone there has mentioned a contrast between producing text and using conventions. And also several of you have noticed the difference between simple ideas and straightforward ideas. So thank you. The, the one difference you've found is that at band one, a candidate produces text, but at band three, the candidate uses the conventions of the communicative task. For example, imagine a learner writing an email. If the learner begins with a greeting, something like, Dear Joel, thanks for the email you sent me, then they're using the conventions of an email. For this part of the descriptor, they're at band three. But suppose a learner just begins with, I'd like to come to your party, and doesn't use any greeting. Then they're producing text, but not using the conventions of an email, and so they're at band one. Another difference some of you noticed in the descriptors is that at band one, a learner can communicate simple ideas in simple ways, while at band three, they can use generally appropriate ways to communicate straightforward ideas. At band one, this might mean communicating an idea which only needs a few words, while at band three, the idea might call for a longer sentence. So a learner who tries to use more complex language can be rewarded with a higher band, provided that what they write is still generally appropriate. You can see on the screen that band two is also available, but doesn't have its own descriptor. This is because band 2 performance shares some features of band 1 and some features of band 3. Imagine an email which includes appropriate greetings, like band 3, but includes only simple ideas, like band 1. This would be a band 2 score for communicative achievement. Another task for you now. Can you read the descriptors for band 3 and band 5? then type in the chat box any differences you find. So please focus now on band 3 and band 5 and type in any differences you find between them. So many of you picking up on the expression hold the target reader's attention. Task focus, target attention, engaging the reader. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So the key notice you've difference, the key difference you've noticed here, is that at band five, the learner can hold the target reader's attention. What this means is the reader can read the text smoothly and follow the meaning. There's no need to stop and interpret what the writer's trying to say. At band three, the communication's usually okay, but might still require the reader to think about the intended meaning in some places. Band four performance shares features of band three and features of band five. Now let's have a look at a different subscale. Take a look at the subscale on the screen. Which subscale is it? Please type your answer in the box. So which of the four subscales can you see on the screen now? Yep, thank you. That's right. Everyone's right. This is the language subscale. And again, the one you can see is B1 level, which is preliminary or PET level. Let's take a look at the differences between the bands here. Can you find the differences between the bands and type your answers in the chat box? So I see people picking up on the terms basic and everyday. People are picking up on degree of control, impeding communication, you've also noticed. 
Some other people have picked up on the idea of complex language. And I'm also seeing other people writing about range of language. So exactly, those are the key points. In terms of vocabulary at band one, the writer uses basic vocabulary. At band three, the writer includes more everyday vocabulary. At band five, the writer's rewarded for using a wider range of vocabulary, even if their use isn't always entirely successful. In terms of grammatical forms, at band one, the writer has some degree of control over structures. At band three, the writer has a good degree of control. And at band five, the key difference is range. Here, the learner uses a variety of structures, including some which are complex. Provided there's still a good degree of control, this ambition will be rewarded. Some of you picked up that we do look at language errors within the subscales, but they're not the only factor in the subscale. Even a band 5 performance might contain errors, provided the meaning is still clear and there's still control of language demonstrated. To see the language subscale in action, let's look now at an example of writing from a B1 level exam. What you can see on the screen now is a response to a question from part two of the Beck preliminary writing exam. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read it and I'd like you to think about the B1 descriptors for language which we've just seen. Please read the text and decide what language mark you would give to this text. Please type your mark into the chat box. And I can see a range of marks coming in. Um, lots of three, lots of band four. A couple of people have given band five. A few of you band one. So I think mainly lots of band three and band four coming in. Thank you. Uh, so that's an interesting range of marks. In fact, this script was awarded band two for language. That's band two. Let's take a look at why. We can see that there's appropriate use of everyday vocabulary and not just basic vocabulary. For example, my role in the company, managing director, and special offers. These are more than basic, these are the everyday vocabulary. Some of you might think that the second sentence has some very good vocabulary. He says, holding a series of meetings on the first Tuesday of each month. In fact, this sentence was included in the exam question. The candidate copied it from the task and also added some mistakes. This means the sentence doesn't give us any positive evidence about his language ability. What we can see in the text is appropriate use of everyday vocabulary, so that's a feature of band three. In terms of grammar, we can see simple forms, but no complex ones. There is some control, for example, in thank you for your invitation, but it isn't usually good control. For example, look at the third sentence, which starts my role in the company. The past simple tense isn't appropriate here, and the second part of the sentence lacks a main verb. So we can see some control of simple forms, and that's a feature of band one. When you read this text, you do notice the errors, such as the incorrect plural forms, and sometimes they make it difficult for the reader to understand the meaning. For example, when the candidate writes, my work for improve your country. So, errors may impede meaning at times, and that's a feature of band one. So on the language subscale, this candidate's performance has features of band three and features of band one, which is why band two was given for language. If you'd like to see more examples of different bands at different levels, 
They're available in the teacher handbooks, which you can download from the website. So far, we've looked at how the descriptors can be applied to a candidate's answer and how we can use them to reward positive learner behaviour. What about the opposite? Should we penalise candidates for specific issues? For example, should there be a penalty for writing more than the word limit or less than the word limit? To answer this, let's look back at the construct for writing that Gad explained to us earlier. On the screen now you can see a reminder of the construct and also a question for you to answer. Is it appropriate to have an automatic penalty for responses that are too long or too short? On the left hand side of the screen under your names you can see a tick and a cross. Please decide if you think it should be yes to a penalty or no to a penalty and use the tick or the cross. And here we have the results on the screen. Uh, so many of you didn't give a response. 33% think yes to an automatic penalty and 24% think no to an automatic penalty for under or over length responses. Well, the key point here is that the construct is achievement oriented. We want to assess what learners can do in their writing. Now it is possible for a learner who wrote very few words or very many words still to achieve the four elements of the construct in an effective way. They might still communicate the message effectively with a well-organised text and control of a range of language. Where that's the case, the learner shouldn't be penalised according to our construct, so there's no automatic penalty. It wouldn't reflect what we want to assess. So what does happen? Imagine a candidate has written an answer which is too short, but has included all the content. What about the other subscales? We might well find that other aspects of the subscales aren't covered in a very short answer, and that the candidate will have a lower band for these. For example, they may not have included an effective introduction, and this will affect their mark for communicative achievement. They might have omitted cohesive devices or used only very simple ones. This would affect their mark for organisation. Or perhaps the language they've used doesn't show a good range of more complex structures and this would affect their mark for language. On the other hand, imagine a very long answer where the writers included a range of vocabulary and grammatical forms. This answer might well receive a good mark for language. But what about the other subscales? If the answer is too long because it contains irrelevant points, then the candidate will receive a lower mark for content. If the answer is too long because it isn't well organised, then the mark for organisation might be lower. If this creates difficulty for the reader, the mark for communicative achievement might also be affected. So even though we don't have automatic penalties in the assessment scales, they do allow for weaknesses which may be evident in a candidate's answer. The key thing to remember is look at the subscales. By referring closely to the descriptors and matching them to the learner's performance, we can award the band which is the best match for each learner's strengths and weaknesses. The assessment scales are available publicly in the handbooks and on our website, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But one advantage of this is that you can use them to help your learners. If you make your learners aware of the subscales that will be used in the exam, you can encourage them to consider the different elements of their writing. Not just language, but also content, communicative achievement and organisation too. This will help you and them to identify their strengths and weaknesses and to work on these in appropriate ways. Don't forget that here at ESOL we only see the final product of your learner's writing and our descriptors are expressed in a way that reflects that. You as teachers are in a position to expand on those descriptors 
to give your learners more detailed feedback on their writing. And remember, the descriptors also describe the next step up in performance, which can help you identify targets for your learners to work towards. There are various resources you can use for this. And for example, you can find material in the Cambridge English Official Practice Test Books, published by Cambridge University Press. The example on the screen is from Cambridge English First, Book 5 for FCE. The book gives you sample answers, examiner comments and the assessment scales. You can use these to check your own understanding of the scales. For example, try marking the sample answers and then check whether your marks match the examiners. You can also use this material to help your learners understand how their writing will be evaluated in the exam. Give them a text and jumble up the marks and the examiner's comments. Ask your learners to match them and then discuss with them the key elements of each subscale. Another way to help students become more familiar with the assessment scales is to tell them the band scores and ask them to look at the text for the reasons those scores were given. This can help learners become more confident in evaluating their own writing. They can then go on to use the subscales to check their own work, for example using it as a checklist when they're editing their writing. When you give feedback to your learners, you could use a colour code based on the assessment scales, for example blue for content, green for organisation. Instead of correcting the learner's text, you could underline parts in the relevant colour so that the learner can go back and edit and improve their work. So those are just a few ideas about how you could use the assessment scales in your own teaching. You can find more information about the assessment skills in the handbooks, on the Cambridge ESOL website and in our official preparation materials from Cambridge University Press. You can also find teaching ideas and resources on our teacher support website. For those of you who'd like to know more about the writing construct and the design of the assessment skills, there's also an interesting article in Research Notes which is on the website too.